When a sample is analysed by XPS, we typically measure a sequence of spectra, and these often include a survey and a set of narrow scan regions. And in this video, what I would like to do is illustrate the importance of these additional data to the construction of a peak model for a specific photoemission line. In this case, we're going to look at the molybdenum 3D and fit these data with a set of components that require the use of additional information in order to extract useful information about the amount of molybdenum and these other elements within this sample. The first question that needs to be answered is why do we need a peak model at all for this molybdenum? And the survey spectrum provides the answer to that. That is, we see within the survey spectrum a significant sulfur 2p peak. And the problem is that because there's a sulfur 2p there must be a sulfur 2s. And if we look at the element library and identify the sulfur peaks, we can see that there ought to be a sulfur peak that is at or around the position of the molybdenum. If I indicate the molybdenum, we can see that there's an overlap. Now this is not always true for all forms of molybdenum and sulfur. A sulfide may have a sulfur peak which is offset from the molybdenum peaks. However, in this case, we're dealing with a sulfate. And these sulfur peaks are binding energies that coincide with this molybdenum 3D. Hence, there is a need for a peak model to separate the molybdenum 3D signal from the sulfur 2S. Now, since there is an overlap here with the molybdenum 3D and the sulfur 2S, we ought to ask the question, is it possible to use another molybdenum peak to perform this analysis? And when we look at these other possible molybdenum peaks, we can see that the cross-sections are significantly lower than the molybdenum 3D. In fact, if we look at the molybdenum 3S, you can barely see there's a peak there at all. And in fact, it's probably below the detection limit for these data. So the other possibility would be the molybdenum 3P. And while it looks like we've got a doublet here, the relative intensity of these two peaks ought to be in the ratio of 2 to 1. And this is not the case. So there's the possibility that there is an interference between the molybdenum and some other element. And in fact, if we look at nitrogen, you can see that there is the possibility of a nitrogen 1s occurring at the same position as the molybdenum 3p 3 halves. So this means that if we were to use the molybdenum 3p, we would have to use the low intensity peak. And since we have a low intensity of molybdenum anyway, there's the potential for significant errors when we calculate the peak area of such low intensity on such a background. The survey spectrum has demonstrated the relationship between the molybdenum 3D and the sulfur 2S. However, it's not until we look at the high resolution data of the narrow scan for molybdenum 3D can we see that there's slightly more to this than simply saying there is an overlap. If we examine these peaks while it's clear there's a, a doublet involved, the shape of this background leading up to this doublet is evidence of the sulfur 2S, which is quite a Lorentzian peak. And the fact that it's Lorentzian means that the background definition of this peak will be very important when we want to work out the amount of substance. An important part of understanding the shapes involved in this peak model is to see data that is related in some way. So I've got another example of a sulfur peak that was measured from a sample that was supposed to have molybdenum upon it, but for some reason the analysis area did not include a significant amount of molybdenum. And here is an example of a sulfur 2S that presumably is also a sulfate. And when we look at this sulfur peak, it turns out to have a Lorentzian form that's indicated by an LA1,66. This is a, a distinctly Lorentzian shape that is fitting these data. Now it's also got a certain degree of asymmetry here, but the suspicion is that the asymmetry is actually due to a small, a very small amount of molybdenum within this sample. So although I've included some asymmetry, this is probably incorrect in terms of modeling the the true shape of the sulfur peak, but we can take from this analysis that 
at the very least even a deformed sulfur 2s peak by virtue of a small amount of molybdenum will have a very strong Lorentzian tail and this is what we saw in the molybdenum sulfate spectrum a wing that extends beyond the molybdenum data the next question is what should the molybdenum peaks look like that will be in the same peak model as the sulfur 2s and while we can see the molybdenum 3d three halves peak the five halves peak is clearly overlaying with the sulfur 2s so we would like to see what a molybdenum in a six plus state might look like so if we look at these data this is molybdenum 3d from a six plus oxide now this is not identical to the sulfate but it'll be a good first order approximation to what these peaks ought to look like so we can construct a peak model based on a pair of peaks in the proportions we see here and possibly with a similar type of background but not necessarily the case and then take the shape of the sulfur 2s and apply these peaks to the data of interest the final point to consider is what type of background we should apply to these data now if we look at the sulfur 2p and place a background on the 2p that is simply a linear background then it's possible to see that this is a relatively flat background there's a slight rise that occurs out here but beneath the sulfur 2p we can approximate the background as a flat background so this would motivate the use of a flat background in this case I'm going to add a minimum limits background and arrange for these limits so that we fit the data close to the peak now I may need to make a small adjustment to the offset and with this background and the two forms of the peaks that come from the other molybdenum sulfur data then the peak model can start to take shape we can now gather the peak models from these other data and the first one I'll do is the molybdenum trioxide so I'm going to copy all of these components and then returning to the data of interest I can say paste replace so these have now come in with the energy calibration that was in the previous file and obviously there's a difference here they have not been calibrated so the fact that the peaks are in a different position is not a surprise that's a consequence of charge compensation but what I'd like to do is shift these peaks beneath the data and one of the ways of doing this is to lock all these components together now they have different component indices so I'm going to say lock all and then this will create a lock between each one of these components in terms of a an offset in energy and that will be independent of the component index which would have been used if I just entered lock so now that I've locked these components they've been locked to this controlling component here in terms of position I can now slide these data and position them appropriately according to this spectrum now before pressing fit what I need to do is create another component and this component will be the sulfur 2s and I need this to have a line shape that is similar to the one that I saw in the other data that was an LA 1 comma 66 line shape a very Lorentzian line shape so I'm going to press return on that and I will assign a different component index so we can see the three different components that represent photo emission the components with minus one these are background components so I'm now ready to say fit so I'll use a chi-square rather than a root mean square and fit so I end up with a peak model that fits these data with the residual standard deviation that looks plausible and we have a set of component peaks reproducing the data 
a small background associated with the molybdenum. This may or may not be correct, but there is certainly a step in the background from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. So there's some sort of adjustment to the background beneath these peaks. And we're assuming that this is coming from the molybdenum. We can now display the results from this peak model using the quantification option. And the reason that I'm using the quantification option on the annotation dialog window is because I want to do a comparison of this Solver 2S with signal from the Solver 2P. And I can do this if I use a table that is based on both, meaning both components and regions. So if I press apply, I see the start of a table. And the reason it's the start of a table is because it's based on the selection that we see in the right hand side. So when I make a selection of the Solver 2P as well, because I'd created a region on that, I also obtain a measure for the amount of sulfur based on a region from the Solver 2P. If I deselect the first one, you can see we just see the Solver 2P. So we have to have both selected in order to see the table. And what we would like to see, if we've created a peak model that is representative of the material, is that the amount of sulfur would be the same between both the sulfur 2S and the sulfur 2P. So as it stands, it would appear that the sulfur 2S component has a greater area than the area calculated from the sulfur 2P. And I'm assuming that the corrections are appropriate for this type of sample to allow a comparison between these two photo emission peaks. So the right RSFs, the right escape depths, and the right transmission function. A comparison of this form is useful for working out whether the peak model is providing a meaningful result for these data. And it would seem that the Sulphur 2S as part of this peak model is too large an area that when quantified and compared against the Sulphur 2P is producing a disparity that perhaps we need to address. Now one of the things that we could do is rather than using a Lorentzian that is consistent with the data that was previously used to fit the Sulphur 2S, we could change this and increase the Gaussian contribution. And as a result of in introducing more of a Gaussian in the Voigt function, then the area of this peak will change. As you can see, the residual has altered. And when I say fit, we end up with a change in the residual. And we also end up with a change in the area. And this is because a Voigt function that is Lorentzian is pushing signal at quite a distance from the peak maximum compared to a Voigt function that has a, a greater Gaussian contribution. So when we quantify data, we have to make sure that we've chosen the right shapes and indeed the right intervals over which to integrate signal in order to do a comparison between, in this case, sulfur 2S and sulfur 2P. Now there's a margin of error here, which is certainly within bounds of what you'd expect for quantification by XBS. So at this point, we might feel more comfortable that the peak model is more representative of the relationship between molybdenum and the sulfur. Comparing the sulfur 2S to the sulfur 2P is an important part of gaining confidence in the peak model. But equally, the relationship for these two component peaks were determined by the molybdenum based on a fit to molybdenum trioxide. And if we look at the table of components, we can see that the two component peaks that are the photo emission from molybdenum 3D are constrained by the area, the forward half maximum, and the position. So while there are two peaks here, there are actually only three fitting parameters that are available when the fit button was pressed. So these two and the relationship of this three halves peak to the five halves peak is one of the factors that has determined where the sulfur 2S component ultimately resides in terms of optimization. Another test against other data would certainly be an advantage. And this same peak model has been applied here to another set of spectra that were measured from a different type of molybdenum sample. It's a molybdenum sample that also has a sulfur content.
and so a suitable fit has been performed to these data and produced results that are comparable to what was obtained for the molybdenum sulfate. Any comparisons and any tests against other data are an important part of determining whether a peak model is realistic or otherwise. As you can see, the line shapes can alter the relationship between peaks, so if we're comparing the amount of molybdenum to the amount of sulfur, it's really important to obtain a line shape that is appropriate for not just the one spectrum, but for similar spectra.